All right, it's time for the interview, and uh, my guests are joining me right now. We will be looking at illicit financial uh, flows, IAFs. Uh, for those of you that watched the show in the past uh, two or three days, uh, we did talk about the report that was released by Global Financial Integrity, and it did tell us about illicit financial flows out of uh, Africa and out of developing countries, not just Nigeria or, or the rest of Africa. So... From my immediate right is Shuai Adia Debayo, who is a chartered accountant. Welcome to the program. Thanks for joining me on the show. Thank you, Nancy, for having me. Mohamed uh, Danjuma is uh, a development expert. He's also joining me to my immediate left. Welcome. Thank you very much, And Nancy. thanks for joining me on the show. Where should we start from? I think I should start <coughs> by telling our viewers that uh, illicit financial flows, which is IAF, so illegal movements of monies, or capital from one country uh, to, the, uh, to the other. Uh, Global Financial Integrity re released a report two days ago, I guess, yes, mm -hmm. two days ago, mm -hmm. and it classified an illicit flow when the funds are illegally end, uh, when funds are illegally transferred mm -hmm. or utilized. Uh, some examples, they gave us some examples like drug, money, mm -hmm. and importer using trade miss invoicing and all of that. Mm -hmm. The question will be, why have we seen illicit financial flows growing, especially out of developing countries? Because when I also went mm. through the report, not just Nigeria or some countries in Africa, we're also seeing that some, you know, developing countries, even Bangladesh, I saw. Mm -hmm. So wh wh why do you think it is so? Ah, uh, thank you, Nancy. It will continue to be so because IFF's uh, illicit financial flow is a thing that is not jamming and is very paramount in Africa development country, especially in developing country, especially Nigeria. Why is because we are yet to tighten the internal control mechanism. And if the foundation is flawed, there will always be an outflow of funds out of the developing country. Let's take for example, if you are yet to tighten your corporate governance, like if you remember, it's on your show that we have uh, the financial intelligence unit that is giving us a sanction that if we are here to do one or two things right, but thank God that the House of Assembly quickly come up to the speed, National the National mm -hmm. Assembly, they come up to speed and pass a law, then that session was lifted. But are we still getting it right? Yes or no? Is no. Because uh, we need to have a framework to track our fund. This illicit financial flu is like an epidemic that is deep rooting in our system. We have EFCC, yes, taking care of it. We have Nigeria Financial Intelligence Unit under them. But that is not adequate enough to eradicate this flow of funds. We have two means to it. When we say illicit, it can be illegal, not permissive. But there is another one that is legal, but it's immoral. When I say legal, you look at taxation. There is what we call transfer pricing, mm -hmm. where organizations outside the shore of the country operating in Nigeria can use that mechanism to reperpetrate front, front, uh, funds to their own country using what we call transfer pricing. Transfer pricing is where you ask your subsidiary in Nigeria, you're operating in US, you ask your subsidiary in Nigeria to charge the US organization, for example, lower so that when they are selling to their own parent company in US, then the amount can be transferred indirectly, but using a legal means. So we need to strengthen our internal mechanism through federal revenue on transfer pricing. That's one hand on its own. That's a legal means that is immoral. The illegal means, which we refer to as a uh, money laundry, or that, those one is uncountable. But we can still curtail it if the government wants to curtail it. Okay. And how? We'll come back to the yeah. how in a bit. Mm -hmm. Mohamed, what's your own view? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, I agree with my colleague. And of course, also, we should also remember that um, it's. It, this phenomenon just does not exist in isolation in any member, especially in, our, uh, in developing countries. If there is no incentive in the developed countries for the receipt of some of these illegal um, funds. So it has to be a global effort 
in collaboration with these developed countries, where most of these tax havens or um, um, destination, illegal destination for these funds, uh, finally find their way to. You know, as as much as we 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 also have regulatory um, um, laws and um, policies in place, another challenge that is, continues to remain with us is impli is um, enforcement and implementation of some of these laws that are already there. In fact, we have too many of them. If I if I may use if I may put it that way, but enforcement continues to remain a challenge, and the trend continues to become um, attractive, especially when. Uh, for us in Nigeria, it is even more so considering our, our economy, which is more or less oil-based. And if you look at it, Nigeria tops um, in sub-Saharan Africa uh, as the country that has the most exporter of illicit financial flow. So ours, our main ch major challenge is enforcement and then, of course, collaboration with other um, um, countries that are destination of some of these um, 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 illicit funds. You know, if you're talking about, if we come down to Africa, South Africa and uh, Nigeria top the list. I think South Africa got, uh, in terms of illicit financial flows, over 10 billion U.S. dollars. Nigeria over 8 billion uh, U.S. dollars. We've also seen that that trend is more in developing countries because I think in 2013, according to GFI, you did say that about 1.1 trillion dollars yeah. left developing countries mm -hmm. in 2013. That's it. Now, the question will be, where does all this illicit financial flows, where does it go to? Where does the money go? <laughs> Is it, isn't it? Because it's, <laughs> where does the money go to? Uh, it's a big question to be answered. And uh, we can't deny the fact that the monies have taken wings in the courts to go to the Western world. It goes to the Western world. Yeah. And the um, bulk of it goes to the Western world. Why we say that is because of uh, the other eight released by President Muhammad Buhari. Investigations have revealed that a lot of Nigeria have perpetrated fraud funds to overseas. And for us to get this fund back, we need an order to track those funds. And they have synergized with those Western world to say that this or that it, anybody that per perpetrate front to overseas, either through money laundry or any other means they have done that, they need to declare it within the six month window given by the order that if they face to declare it, it will go back to the government coffers. Meaning that we understand that there are a illicit fund domiciled in the Western world. We need to be factual with ourselves. And aside from Western words, there are still illicit from within the country. Mm -hmm. You imagine where some we had a bunker, where some <laughs> we dug <laughs> and keep this from in at currencies. In their so houses, or in the backyards. So or the backyards, house, houses, yeah. poultry house, mm. dog uh, holes, and keep all this from. They are still illicit. Yes. Funds. It's just that it's within, those who are within the, the, country. the country. But chunks of it, chunk of it is outside the country. And, and, and that's, 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 <coughs> that's not even to mention the shell companies that are created just as conduits for some of these funds or um, shadow foundations that yes. are set up, mostly in collaboration with um, foreign partners to have some of these funds. Because if you look at, for example, the foundations, uh, even though it varies from country to mm -hmm. and one country to another, there are some um, tax exemptions that they have. Yes. So some of them, like he said, are legal but immoral. While there are some others that are completely illegal. For example, some of the shell companies that are set, so set up to do that. And mm -hmm. it may shock you to even know that the, um, um, that's, uh, the development assistance being contributed by the member countries of the um, um, OECD. The illicit funds that flow out of the countries, especially in developing countries, are far more than the development assistance being received. So that's to tell you that it is a, it's a huge challenge that we must find a way of tackling. And I must commend the administration for trying, this administration for trying to block some of these loopholes where the leakages uh, have been endemic for, for, a, for a very long time now.
Mm. You know, just like you said, when I asked the question, where is the money going to? And you did say the Western world. Of course, we must also say there are banks offshore, yes. isn't it? Yes. Financial centers, mm -hmm. even, yes. even, uh, even abroad. Yeah. And most of these monies, they get profits from it. And just like you noted, that some of these illicit financial flows are even more than the monies that we expect exactly. at development exactly. uh, assistance. assistance. At the uh, STI reports in 2018, it was revealed that uh, 50,000, 50 US dollar, 50 billion dollar. That's 50 billion, billion US dollars. US dollar yeah. Flow out of the country. And if you are converting it to Nigeria currency, you are talking about 17.5 trillion. 17.5 trillion, you know that to equivalent. What is our budget? It's not up to that. Our budget is about 25 billion dollars. I mean, 17.5 trillion. Mm -hmm. 17.5 trillion. And our budget is just. Uh, That's our yearly budget. Yearly budget. It's the highest, like 25 billion, 26 billion dollars. Dollars. So it means it's not up to what is going out of the country as illicit fund, using either uh, legal means or illegal means. So the way to tackle the menace is what my brother have just said that. Government are trying, but the effort is not enough. Let's put the right peg in the right hole. How do you think that, how, or which conduct pipe is more in terms of that illicit financial flows? Because we know that illicit financial flows can take different yes. uh, um, uh, methods, like the, a drug cartel, even mm. an importer are using mm. trade, missing voicing, like I said yes. before, to mm. evade custom mm. duties, VAT, tax yes. or income taxes. Mm. A corrupt public official yeah. are too using an anonymous shell company, mm. just like you raised mm. earlier. Human trafficker also carrying a briefcase of cash across mm. the border. Mm -hmm. That could also be, all these that I've listed are examples of illicit financial flows. Which do you think is Nigeria suffering from more? Uh, for me, I think for Nigeria, it's mostly from the extractive industry. Yeah. Because that is where bulk of our, even Forex is. Yeah. So, and the incentive is even more there. Just um, two or three days ago, I saw the government um, trying to, to, to put a mechanism to track um, illegal bunkering and all those okay, things. Okay, with so EFC, EFCC? Yes, yes. And you see, we have still not been able to document how much we are losing in terms of resources <coughs> from some of these illegal activities around our main source of income, which is the oil. Not to talk of um, other um, mineral, minerals that have been uh, pilfered away by, by, by illegal mining and all that. You know. So I think for us, the extractive industry, on industry pr pr presents the highest risk for us to this um, um, phenomenon. How about the, the, the rise of Boko Haram? Because I also do know that terrorist wiring money yes. is also part of illicit financial flows. And don't also forget that uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria is among the top uh, on the list mm -hmm. in terms of terrorist, terrorism around the world. Mm -hmm. Do you think that also, how are they even getting funded? Is even something we've not looked at, of which course. is also an illicit of course, financial yes. flow. It is. Yeah, because terrorists wiring money like from Middle East to Europe exactly. is an illicit yes. financial yeah. flow. Because if you even look at the trend, is we've been in on uh, with this insurgency now for for years, for, for, a, years. for a decade or more now, and um, you, we know how much it's even costing us as a nation to, to fund combat, yes. to fund our uh, our military, military to even combat this menace. Not to talk of. Um, um, an, an illegal outfit like Boko Haram, how they've been funding, funded to be able to um, sustain this um, And how is Boko Haram funding itself? That is what we are saying. Which we've not even looked at. Which uh, looked that, that's why I'm yeah. bringing yeah. it up. So some of those loopholes like he has mentioned are, are some of the ways that present the opportunity for some of these things to do. And even our financial systems across the central bank um, um, and um, a few other regulatory agencies that we have. For example, now somebody can give somebody dollars in, in, in UAE and with a simple phone call, he comes here and collects a, the similar amount from somebody else, from the B, a, a bureau de change. That is also an, an another, another, another um, conduit Yes. because there is a network that our financial and uh, the NFIU must really clamp down on, especially with, uh, from among our uh, bureau de change and, uh, and um, operators of um, forex like that.
In addition to what you have mm -hmm. just said, uh, as regards the Boric decision, because uh, in 2018, there is a report that have a STR, suspicious, uh, suspicious transaction report. Track to EFCC, we have 61 cases of suspicious transaction reports. Those reports has to do with add currency, dollars, pounds. Then when we give out, CBI is trying on their own, but they still need to tighten some aspect of it. When we give out this dollar, are we going, are we doing due diligence of where this dollar are going to? Is it just a mere filling of forms? Many of them are used to mere filling of forms. Mm -hmm. Writing name that Mr. A bought from Mr. B. If you look at the handwriting and all the documentation required by CBN, you will see that it's perfected. But if you are looking beyond it, you will know that this IFF, illicit forms flow, is through this uh, uh, dollar flow. Aside from that, you ask a question. How does Boko Haram fund their so, activities? Yeah. You see, it is a question that the experts need to answer. If we get our financial statement right, if the we have in line with International Accounting Standard 1, mm -hmm. presentation of financial statement, that mandated that all companies must prepare their financial statement and it must be audited and presented to the user six months after the year end. How many companies are doing that in Nigeria? How many companies are doing that in Nigeria mm -hmm. until when we answer that question. So some fund can leak to those Boko Haram sets through not accountability by organization. Aside from that, the Boko Haram activities gain ground now or they continue to work strong because they are getting funds from one or two places. Though we have not validated where they are getting from. But if we strengthen our reporting entity, ensuring that all is audited by uh, an expert, audit firm, or whatever, and is within that system, we'll be able to track. Then lastly, federal land revenue, they are losing a lot of fund due to we not having what we call social insurance uh, number. Individual citizen, when you are doing any transaction, it will be tracked to you that you are the one doing it. BVN have assisted us a lot. We can track fund now from BVN mm -hmm. that belongs to a particular post, uh, organization or individual. But if we can get that of social security number right, I have my number, you have your number, he has his number, and when we are transacting How about anything. the national identity number? Is that it? national identity number, my sister, we are not yet getting there. Yet there. We are not getting it right. Why? I, that is speaking to you, have done mine more than six years. I'm here to get it. We, the government, know what to do. The moment we are all captured with one single identification number, it will eliminate driver license, it will eliminate all that thing. There and there, anybody transacting business, that number will be key to it. Either illicit form or no illicit form, we'll be able to track it out. Through that unique number, and it will tie to our bank, B uh, BVN, or any transaction we are doing. Yeah, so another um, um, point of um, vulnerability, of course, is our porous borders. <coughs> we have porous borders that are very, very poorly manned and have, have also presented a gateway for so many illicit things flowing in and out of this country, especially around the fringes of the north where we are bordered with by countries like uh, Chad, Niger, and um, of course even the Benin Republic here. You know? So if you look at the number of vehicles, even though the, the government is trying now, but there's still a lot that needs to be done. The number of cars that come into this country or material that come in unchecked, it's also we, somebody can just stash if 10 vehicles are carrying money and w you just caught one, nine have passed. Have passed, yeah. You know? So there's still a lot that needs to be done. And that now behoves on the government to strengthen the capacity of our customs. Ensure that our borders are tightened. And all these also link up with the issue of data, like he said. We must know who we are. We must have some form of identity that is linked across financial, health, education, and 
all these things that is required for even the security agencies to be able to know who is Mr. A and who is Mr. B, you know, so that any transaction is able to be monitored. And that is one of the things that has reduced it. If you find the see the developing countries, those are the areas that have been able to reduce it to the barest minimum. And for us, we are not even able to even measure it, how much we are losing, let alone even quantify um, the ramification of what we are losing. Because we do not know, we don't have a specific mechanism that will be able to know how much we are losing. Because we don't have that credible data that will help us know. Let's go back to the barest uh, basics. How many are we in Nigeria? Mm. About 190. We are still guessing. What did you just say? It's an education. We are still guess. guessing. <laughs> <laughs> At least the, the chairman of National Population Commission that I interviewed some months ago, I asked him how many are we in Nigeria, and he did tell me as at that time, 194 million people. Why some people will say 200 million? million. Yes. Why some people will also say we are not as many as we say we are? Exactly. Some people will say we are not up to 190 million people. Yeah. That and is just yes. It's just padded. Yes. And all this is as a result of lack of credible data. We have not really done the scientific way of capturing who we are. Where, where are these people? What, what do you do for a living? How many people do we have that are out of job? How many people do we have that are educated? And what is their educational qualification? How many people are even financi financi uh, financially include inclusive. Uh, inclusive? That way. You know, so there is so much that... Um, we have some of those data, but is it that we shouldn't depend on those, those data? Because if you take a look at the National Bureau of Statistics, they bring out some of those mm -hmm. data for us. Yeah. But is it that we shouldn't depend on uh, those data? Is still, uh, they are still questionable? They are still questionable. It says that it has not been validated. Validated in what sense? What God do you bless mean by you. that? Uh, look at the year we have we do our census, is it not 2005? Mm, 2006. Six, six, so. five, mm -hmm. six. Yeah. See that? And by law, it's almost every 10 years. Exactly. Every 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we are due to know our population. We were as due as by 2016. 2016. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We're in 2019. 2019. Mm. So three years gap. So by that, we are not having enough information to qualify the reliability of our data. How about for those that are on the, uh, 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 that have the school of thought that there, there may be no need for, you know, head count sensors since we have a lot of things that capture data. Driver license mm. is there, national identity mm, yes. number is there. A whole lot. BVN now. There we have all this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. we, we have all those things. We have all those things. So yes. why can't we? We just have all those things. But if you look at our population as it as it is today, the large number of people that are active in all those areas you are talking about, whether they have BVN, that means they have a bank account. Mm. Whether they have driver's license, that means they have they own a car. They own a car. Whether they have um, what's the other one? National identity mm. number. National identity mm. number. That means they have um, ECOWAS passports. ECOWAS passports or something like that, or they have access to yeah. be able to get the identity number. Identity number. Yeah. So look at the 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 uh, the our, our population. Seventy percent of our people are not even within that range to get all range this. to get all those things. So what are we saying? So there's still need for a head count. Yes, we haven't headcount. gotten there yet that we'll be able to now the be moment, projecting and you the know? moment we have the final head count, now we can deploy IT solution. Mm -hmm. Let's say whenever we are giving birth in the hospital, the term of the baby or whatever they But they do birth registration and birth all that. registration that some people may not have done up to or before five years before and they will go to one uh, hospital and get a birth registration <laughs> that the registers are there. Many people are backdating it. Nancy, let's be factual. The way we can go with the development of technology, we are still backward, but we can get it right. If we do the last eight counts, then the next roll up will just be to use what we have on our system, what we have synchronized to update the data on they, on a monthly or weekly basis, as we enroll or when we have new, new entrance, new entrance and our exit. I mean, we are headed for an election in a couple of um, days. Uh, days. And if you look at the data released by INEC of the total regist people registered, mm. total registered voters, 
I think it's um, a little over 80 million or so. Yes. How many people have collected their BVNs, uh, their, um, what do you call it, voter, voter card? It is still, there is still a lot of people that have not collected their... their so in essence, what we are trying to say is that we can't sufficiently track IFFs if we do not have enough credible data. data and credible data. Credible uh, data. That's why this issue of... To know who does what. Mm -hmm. Exactly. To know who transfer what. For exactly. what purpose do they transfer? And what is it meant for? Is it for the good of the country or mm -hmm. for negative aspect of the country? Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about even trade misinvoicing because the GFI okay. report did say that trade misinvoicing facilitates rising IFFs in mm -hmm. countries like Nigeria. Sure. And I did mention trade uh, misinvoicing uh, like an importer using trade misinvoicing mm -hmm. to evade tax, mm -hmm. yes. to evade custom mm -hmm. duties and all of that. Mm -hmm. How much of this is it's, it's a challenge for us? Uh, if you look at, uh, this is common with uh, the transporters, I mean, car dealers, by ensuring that the trade missing invoicing reduce what needs to go to the federal government coffers or what needs to go to the federal government by ensuring they negotiate with uh, their dealer over there. Yes, it's $30 million, but I want you to give me $3 million so that when I'm paying my custom duty on it, I will pay less amount of it. But despite that, I will know how to transfer your balance to you. Then, indirectly, we are missing $27 million there that escapes the system. Syst the system. So through that means, we can, uh, government can, we can say that the increase in IFF is due to missing invoice, as you have rightly quoted. But how can we track it? Yes. It still boils down to we having a credible data yes. that we capture individual. The one we have with national identity management, I'm not saying it's not good, but we need to fine tune every. We still need to go down there because that's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. Like uh, you over there, you say uh, uh, you, you are not standing straight. The person will reply, by not standing straight is from the top, not from the down. So what I'm trying to say is that we need to go back and try to ensure that we have a credible data that will speak to individual, not the one we are compiling on app as a basis, real safety, custom, this, mm -hmm. this. No, let's okay. unify. And, and, and Very quickly, yeah. Yes, and also, the, if you look at the trend, even from the GFI report, you will see that the, the trade invoicing for us, particularly in Nigeria, that has reduced. And basic, mostly is as, that can be ascribable to the recession. <laughs> the recession that we were in, and of course, tr trades, whether bilateral, international, redu reduced. reduced significantly. So by implication also, the, the trade invoicing aspect also uh, reduced. But that doesn't mean it does not exist. Mm. Yes. Now, just as we end the interview, you mentioned how. Yeah. But I can infer all the how we can avoid um, illicit financial flows mm. from what both of you have said, but in just a few seconds, can you just recap for us? Because in all what you, both of you have been saying, you've been giving us the solution how we can, yeah. <laughs> you know, stop the menace. But just quickly summarize it for me the again. The first that we can do is to have a framework in capturing individual data. That will be departure for what we have done in the past. Put holistic mind to it. Put a natural mind that we Nigerians want to have a credible data that will be relied upon without a political advantage to any region. That's number one thing we need to do. Number two, we need to strengthen our Federal Inland Revenue Service. They passed, they, they, they submitted a proposal a B to the National Assembly, but it was stepped down. What they are trying to do is also to block this illicit fund in regards to transfer pricing mechanism that they used to repatriate from to overseas. This is part of it, if you can strengthen that aspect. Number three is to ensure that all uh, international agencies like OACD, we just have 30 members there. Nigeria is not part of it. If we can play our role or our way there, then strengthen our financial intelligence unit with the EFCC, with the ICPC, strengthen. We have them there, but we need to strengthen and implement it without allowing the law to favor any part of the country or anybody. 
the moment you can get it straight like that, that yes, if you are caught to be party to illicit fund transfer, then you face the penalty as enshrined by EFCC law or ICPC or National Financial Intelligence Unit. Okay. So, uh, okay. So l let's take your own recommendation. Yeah, just to add a few things to the the, the recommendations she has said. One of which, one of the key one is the the, the federal, federal inland revenue, the tax issue. I think the government must deliberately we must embrace technology, and we must join the rest of the world in ensuring that we use the resources available to us to strengthen our systems and pursue automatic cross-border exchanges of tax mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. You know, especially on personal and businesses, mm -hmm. that uh, and so that daily accounts are on real time. We can see who is doing what, and we have a system that compare notes with our with our counterparts, especially developing countries. So, of course, the government has started, but a lot of effort needs to be done in ensuring that we strengthen these bilateral relationships, especially al 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 um, um, around financial issues, you know, uh, across border. Okay, so you mentioned so at least we we have an understanding here on the program that the cross cross border um, monitoring should be more. Yes, data should be more credible, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes. You also, I, I think we should also mention the trade invoicing thing that we should mm -hmm. need. Yeah. We should try as much as possible uh, to curtail trading mm -hmm. mis 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 invoices. Uh, uh, yes. uh, invoicing. The basic thing which we all or which both of you all have said is to improve transparency. Exactly. Isn't it? Yes. yes. And accountability. Accountability. And accountability. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. I think we'll leave it at that. Many thanks for joining me on the program today. Thank you. Thank All you right. I've much. been uh, speaking with uh, Shuaib Bu Adia Debayo, a chartered accountant, as well as Muhammad Danjuma, who is a development expert. Uh, we've been talking uh, about IFFs, that is illicit financial flows. Uh, the report was released by Global Financial Integrity, and Nigeria is not even doing well on that. Uh, in that report, 8.3 billion U.S. dollars as illicit financial flows out of the country. It's also noteworthy to say that Mexico uh, has the highest illicit financial flows of about of more than actually 42 billion dollars. All right, thank you, gentlemen, for coming. Thank, thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you.